So we've got a lot to talk about tonight. And first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you. And how are you doing at this crazy historic moment? You know, I, I always, April and all who are with us tonight, try to focus on the largest spiritual cycles at work. Because even when things look like they're falling apart, and some days I feel that way, as though they are falling apart, they're really not. The divine hand is always in it. You know, and sometimes it, it's mess. Life is messy. It's messy, and at times it's very, very difficult. And there is no, there's no emotion. There's no feeling that is constant. You know, we laugh, we cry, we lose, we gain. Mm -hmm. There's happiness, there's sadness. And what we have to do is really learn how to trust. Trust yeah. life, trust God, trust the Holy Spirit by whatever name we call it. So that's the space I try to live in. Mm -hmm. I don't always succeed. It takes work. It's easy, easier to write about it than it is to live it. Mm -hmm. Living it is difficult. So, you know, right now there is, since there is a racial reckoning in this nation, people are going buying black books. So In the Spirit is one of those books. A lot of books are coming back. And yours is one of them, In the Spirit, correct? That's correct. So, and it was, it was published in 1993. It's and my first book. And what was yesterday is still today. I still have, it was my coffee book table, believe it or not, mm -hmm. in my home in the 90s. I was like, I wanted to be, I wanted to seem like it was smart. I was like, I've got, I've got Susan Taylor on my <laughs> table. And I think I lent it to someone and I never got it back. But oh. I'll get another copy. But but talk to us about the, the, the pieces, because we used to read it in essence. Um, talk to us about the pieces that we need to stay in the spirit in this moment of racial reckoning, in this moment of COVID, in this moment of election, um, in this moment when we are hearing the words from the president's mouth that he knew that COVID was worse than the flu. He knew it was airborne, but he did not, he wanted to um, calm the fears, I guess. I, he wanted to down, no, he didn't want to call him because he wanted to downplay it. And, and here we are uh, in September 2020. We have over 180,000 confirmed dead in this nation. That's just confirmed. That's not the whole thing. Right. How do we, what are the components we need for this moment? I think we have to look deeply within ourselves. I think that's the large message, the big learning that this disastrous virus has come to teach us. That, you know, April, we put our value in things. Uh, we value things over people. We value things over all else. And it's a time of reckoning, not only of racial reckoning, it's economic reckoning. Uh -huh. It's looking at ourselves and what we've allowed in our community. That, you know, we are among the first generations of black people to be able to solve poverty, mm. to have the, the, the goods and the grace and the education and all the papers and the learning, the technology, everything that we need to advance the race. And we're not doing as good a job. Uh oh, we got a little bit of glitch, but Susan Taylor is there. I think she's recycling. She's recycling, but guys, She's going to be with us. So nonetheless, I want you to tell people we're going to tune in because we got to keep talking about this. We got to keep talking about helping our brother, helping our sister. Um, and my brother, it's not that I am my sister's keeper. No, it is I am my sister. So yes, while Susan Taylor Vest is, she's coming back. I think she just had a bad signal. So um, let me see. She'll be back. Trust and believe. There she is. I see the great Susan Taylor. Here she is. She's coming back. Here we are. I'm back. Yes, you are. I'm back. I'm back. I'm back. Yes, you are. And so, you know, who, we would never have had this kind of time when we're forced onto ourselves. And for what purpose? To learn how to be our own best friend. And those of us who live alone, probably, well, I shouldn't even say that. It's a struggle to be sheltered and to be by yourself over many, many months. It's also a struggle to have three, four, five children running around your place. 
you know, but it's all for our growth and for our learning. And for us to recognize what Dr. King really tried to teach us some 57 years ago, that we are each other's keeper. Mm. That we're all in this, as we keep saying, we're in this together, we're in this together. We say it, but we don't understand it. We don't understand it. So I think this is a moment. I think pain is information. Pain is That's what it is. It's information. Yeah. Wherever we're hurting is where we need to look. You know, we're not, we, we've made up this, this, this fiction about the Holy Spirit, that God punishes us, mm -hmm. you know, for mistakes. We, we thought that AIDS was a punishment to gay people. How ridiculous. Right. You know, that this now has come to punish us for something. I think the planet Mother Earth is cleaning herself, cleansing herself. And I think life is asking us to do the same thing. Well, the really locusts out here, too. The loc I hear the locusts chirping every morning. <laughs> we, we, you know, and the locusts come. The, the, we have pestilence. We have locusts. Um, we even had killer bees. We've got this disease. We've got race war. I mean, a race, well, I call it a race war. Some people don't want to term it that way. But former President Bill Clinton agreed with me that we're having a race war at this moment. Um, but I, I, I think back to my conversation with Paul S. Morton, Bishop Paul S. Morton, P.J. Morton's daddy. He said, you know, April, when there is um, a corrupt leader, the Bible shows this, things like this happen. I'm paraphrasing what he said, but I was like, wow. And as you said, Mother Nature is cleansing herself. I think there is a total, complete cleansing because this moment is a destroyer. And if you're not strong, as you say, you're going to get a lot of information. And I'm getting a lot of information. <laughs> you know, you talk about how pain is information. Ooh. Some people don't want to know. Fear not. We have to know who we are. That's why we're here. We're here to learn ourselves, to know that we are more than we seem. I think that's the essential message, that we are more than we seem. We're human and divine. And you can earn three PhDs. You can go to the sanctuary every day and not ever come to know your divinity. Mm. I grew up Catholic, went to Catholic school, and never once did I learn that there was anything divine about my. You went to Catholic school, too? I went to Catholic school. Okay. Also. But I went there because my mother my mother sent me to Catholic school because she didn't want me a part of busing in Baltimore. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, I went to Catholic school because the schools in Harlem, the public schools were horrible. Mm -hmm. And my mother said, mm -mm. she changed her faith because one parent had to be Catholic. So she changed her faith so that my brother and I could go to Catholic school. But I always thought that the nuns and the priests had the direct line to God. But the Holy Spirit God, Allah, Jehovah, Yahweh, whatever you call the divinity, is going to bring you to the edge for your awakening. Not your punishment, but to awaken you. And that awakening comes in so many different ways. It usually comes through pain. My prayer is, Lord, let me learn the lessons that life is trying to teach me without my suffering. Mm. Let me be available. And you, get, you become available just by being still. It's so simple, April, we miss it. There's nowhere to go. You don't need an ankh, a rosary bead. You don't need mantras or anything. You just need to understand that the Holy Spirit that we look up in the sky to and believe lives in a sanctuary, that we are little gods. We're not the big God. Mm -hmm. We're the little gods. We're the offspring of the Holy Spirit, mm -hmm. sent to do life's work. We are the, the hands and the eyes and the, the feet Oh. of the Holy Spirit, sent here to make life right. And that's really what's happening now. A new world is on the way. And everything is very messy right now, but a new very world messy. is emerging. So a reckoning, does, as you said. Right. What does this new world look like? Because I, I tell everybody, we're facing a whole new normal. And I, right now, I don't think it's settled in yet. But I, I don't think I want to be, this is just me. You know, I don't want to be so close to people anymore. <laughs> I don't want to not wear my mask. I want to wear gloves every time I go out. You know, what is what is this new normal and the settling in going to look like? Even as we are finding ourselves, but we still have to realize, I found myself, but this is what it looks like out there. Well, you're smart. You're putting on your gloves and your mask and keeping yourself safe because you know we need you and you need you. 
I no, mean, no. It's, it's not even what we had, what, what we thought was normal was crazy. That's true. It's absolutely crazy. So we don't want to go back to that. We're moving on to something that is shining and new and bright that we probably never even imagined. And it really is something that Dr. King and many others have spoken about. We're talking about a world in which everyone has value. Mm. A world in which we don't have people who have so much money that they, they just don't even know what to do with it. And in that, across town, we have people who are hungry and homeless, children growing up in shelters. That's the crime. That's the sin. If there's such a thing as sin, it's that. So we're, we're, we're making that right. The covers have been pulled off of poverty. And this time we have an opportunity to make things right. There is nobody out there trying to murder people. Nobody's packing a gun April when they have a job to go to in the morning. You're home, kicking back, have a little beer, talk to my kids, go to sleep, get up and go to work. Uh -huh. But we have poverty schools. And we have multi-generations who've come through these poverty schools where you don't learn how to read, you don't learn how to write. It makes you unemployable and sick. Because when you can't take care of yourself, you turn to things that may be illegal. But what we do is we blame, we blame people who are in poverty and people who haven't had the opportunities for the failures of our society. Society is failing people. It's not people who are failing. I mean, people are saying your voice. I'm watching the comments. Your voice is so soothing. Someone said, word. This is, this is the gospel according to Susan Taylor in the spirit. <laughs> and and and, I, and you're absolutely right. I believe what we're seeing now is a crescendo moment. The 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 pot has boiled over. People who have felt that they were not touched are now reacting in these very extreme ways. I mean, on all sides of the spectrum, you have people who feel that they don't matter, that they're not touched by government or touched by anyone. And when you have these moments of extreme this or extreme that, I believe it's because of that. And so how do we, how do we touch everyone? How do we make sure everyone is touched? How do we? Because during the Obama administration, there was a certain group that said, oh, I'm touched. But then in this administration, you said, there's a certain group of people saying, oh, I'm touched. But then in each side, you leave, there are people who felt that they're left out. How do we bring everyone in under the umbrella so this can stop? You know, it's, it's ignorance that, that creates hatred. I'm sure that people living and working in the White House don't even know it was built by black people. Don't even know it. You don't, no, do you I, think they do. They, I think they do. They tried, to, they tried to use First Lady Michelle Obama's speech, so that was in that speech. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. And at the convention, that convention speech. <laughs> You know, you, people have no idea what African-American people have withstood. They have no idea that Wall Street, the stock market, was built on slavery. Have no idea, you know, Ivy that... Ivy colleges. Pardon? Were built, Ivy League colleges were built off the backs of slaves in the sugar fields. The philanthropists took that money that they made off free labor and made the schools that we can't even get into. And all of Europe. Look at Europe. Look at the grand um, universities in Europe and the museums and just the palaces. All of this, 250 plus years of uncompensated labor created the wealth of the Western Hemisphere and also in other nations as well. Cotton was king. We talk about tobacco and all the things that black people labored over. And what's so stunning to me, we have to look at ourselves and we have to look at what we lost because we do a lot of finger pointing at one another. You know, we have to stop. We lost everything that was dear and familiar to us. We lost our, our place of origin. We lost our names, our food ways, our religion, family. Nothing is more important to a people than family. We lost it all. So what we're doing now is we're remaking ourselves. We're rebuilding the village. That's, that's what I'm focused on every day, rebuilding the village for our children. So if we have an understanding of who we are and what we have given the world, even though we, we, we were brought here in spoon fashion, in the holes of ships, 
you know, in our vomit, in our excrement. Oh. And all the, most of the European nations participated. Now, we're not pointing the finger. We're saying it's a moment for reckoning, for understanding what black people gave for white privilege. We have to understand that, and we have to understand what we lost so that we can begin to forgive one another for misbehavior. Oh. Relationships. We come back to relationships. We have to learn how to be together. We have to learn how to be with ourselves, and we have to learn how to couple. Because if you can't make two work, then we'll never make the block work and the community work. So this is our work. Learning how to be with your own best friend, who is you, and how to share that, that, that gift of your life with another person and with the community. We are in the spirit. Ooh, we are in the spirit. Alive. <laughs> with the great Susan Taylor, former editor-in-chief of Essence Magazine. And, you know, we're calling for this moment because this moment is great with hurt. It, as Susan Taylor says, pain brings about information. So we are going to gather a lot of information tonight. This is about us. This is about us. As I hear my children upstairs, go upstairs, please. As I hear my children upstairs <laughs> and the dog, they can't get together right now. I don't know How many going. children do you have, April? I've got two. I've got an 18-year-old and I've got a 12-year-old. The 12-year-old is down Ooh. here with me listening to us. And I think that you go upstairs and help her. Can we say hello? Yeah, they'll say hello. Go, go, go help your sister. Um, <laughs> I, I hear the dog and my oldest having a reckoning upstairs, so I don't know what's going on. But no, but you, you hit... You hit the nail squarely. You have to love yourself. I have, I'm in the midst right now of, of, of looking at several friends who are, this is the worst time of their lives, just trying to support them. And they're like, what do you see in me? Why? You know, I'm like, you are worthy just because you are here. And if you don't like yourself, you're absolutely right. If you don't like yourself in this moment, how do you think somebody's going to like it? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm sitting up here trying to support so many people and just making them feel good um, about themselves and about the situation in the midst of all of this horror. We don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. But this is so important because I guarantee you, my two friends are not alone. There are so many people on this, um, on this IG Live who are trying to figure it out. And I think this is a moment that, guys, we need to open up. Tell your friends. Reach out because there are people out here that are hurting, and they need to hear this. And this is one of the reasons when I saw In the Spirit, I said, yes! That was the beginning of it for me. Before Yanla, before a lot of the, the televangelists that we currently see, on, I was reading this, how to come together with yourself. And you were so prolific in your writing and in your honesty with us as a people. And we miss that. We need that, Susan Taylor. Well, you know, we can sum it up. It, I'm not saying that it's, it's not difficult. We have to be consistent. You have to give yourself to yourself mm. before you give yourself away. That's how you demonstrate self-love. Audre Lorde, the brilliant... Um, scholar and poet and writer said it so profoundly. She said, we have been taught to hate ourselves. I'm, I'm not saying it verbatim. We've been taught to hate ourselves so long. We have to learn how to love ourselves and one another again. We have to learn how to do that. And, you know, talking about being in relationships, we teach people how to treat us oh. by how we treat ourselves. That's right. And I say this especially to black women we have to serve ourselves without apology or hesitation. We come out of the womb believing that we're here to serve everybody. Cicely Gay is probably home helping. She's my absolute guru when it comes to social media, and she does that for a lot of other people too. But she is cooking for the family, taking care of the family, taking care of everybody. This is what we do. But that's not what, that's not our assignment alone. And we feel guilty assignment, what we do for ourselves. We do. We do. And we got to get out of that. Your first assignment is for you. It's yeah. with you. Yeah. We come, believe it or not, before those two children upstairs. <laughs> we come before our parents. Mm -hmm. We come before our mates, our jobs. We come before everyone else who is counting on us. I love the way that Gandhi put it. When Gandhi came home from South Africa to India, 
the Indian people, they were wresting power back from the British Empire. And he said, you know, I need to have a day off. And they said, oh, Baba, you can't take a day off. We need you. We're fighting for our freedom. We're fighting for our future. You have to be with us every day. And he said this, which is so true for me. He said, if I don't care for myself, I won't love you well. Mm. I won't love you well. Kevin and I have a little house in the country. Uh, eh, he's nearby. So I'm saying sometimes I've got a little issue with the way he drives. A little too fast, a little too reckless. When I'm not taking care of me, you know what I'm doing? Would you slow down the car? Damn it, I don't want to die in this car with you. Mm -hmm. That's when I'm not taking care of myself and I'm stressed. But when I'm taking time for stillness, when I'm taking time to remind myself that the Holy Spirit doesn't just have your back, the Holy Spirit is your back. Uh. There's nothing you have to worry about. You keep putting one foot in front of the other, you figure it out, and at the end we're all going to be standing around saying, that was a good sister, that was a good brother. Life has right. a beginning and an end, right? But when I'm taking care of myself, April, and Kefra's driving in a way that I think is reckless, I can say, oh, sweetie, can you slow down a little bit? I want to spend the next 40 years with you. And he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, you're right, baby. We have to mind our mouths and watch our minds. Because when we don't, we speak from stress. And there's one thing we cannot do. It's you can't take back those words. You can't take back the harsh words. So give yourself to yourself before you give yourself away. Get up in the morning and be still. Give thanks for life, for breath. You don't even have to breathe. Life is breathing for you, breathing you. Thank you, God. You know, Abel, we have to give thanks for the things we take for granted. There are probably people who are listening who are unsighted, who've lost their oh. sight. There are people who are trying to hear. They have hearing aids. There are people who are listening or watching who are not mobile. If all those things are functioning in your life, give thanks. When you give thanks, when you fill your heart with gratitude, everything you have glows, and it becomes more than enough. So that's where peace starts with. It starts with being grateful. Ooh. And you know, I, I don't know about everyone else, but every day I try to write something. I am a mantra. I am this, I am that. Or Lord, thank you for this. Because it's easy to fall into this, oh my God. Some of my money's gone. Some of this is gone. I'm not going out. I've been in the house literally for five months, and I just literally started going out. And it's just like I'm starting to really, even in the midst of all the trials, I'm like, Lord, thank you. Thank you, because it didn't have to be. I am love. I am loved. I am peace. I am peaceful. I'm trying to align myself, because these we don't know how long this is going to last. We don't know what's next. But like you said, there's going to be something shiny and new when it's all over with. And I want to be, I want to be standing out there like, Susan, did you see how beautiful and shiny it is? Right. So that's what I'm trying to align myself now. And April, let's see it now. You know, this is new. And, you know, some of us have lost family and friends. Yeah. And so Uh-oh, we did it again. There you go. So, okay. I'm back. You said, you said, <laughs> Am you I said back? some of us have lost oh, family, good, okay. friends, and go in the next piece. And that hurts. There's no question about it. It takes time to heal from that. And the Holy Spirit promises us. You know, if we, I know so many people have lost parents. If, if you haven't lost your parent, when you, if you hadn't lost your parent when you were an infant, give thanks. Mm -hmm. Give thanks. Is your mother or your father or your parents alive? Mine, they, my, mine transitioned, but I'm, I still give thanks. My mother transitioned 13 years ago. My father transitioned two years ago. But I thank God that I had them. That's right. And mine have transitioned too. And let's thank God that our parents, those of us who are so fortunate, saw us through to adulthood. That they didn't leave us when we were two or three. Because those are horrific stories that some people can tell about step parents, you know? So what we want to see is what is shining and new about this day. Just to be able to breathe is shining and new. To go outside with your mask on, find a place where you can walk because we need 
we, I think one of the reasons that I have been, you know, a little out of sorts was that I'm not getting the exercise that I need. I'm not getting it because I'm sitting in front of the computer all day trying to raise money to help our children for our foundation. Mm -hmm. But it's, serotonin is the happiness hormone. Mm -hmm. And you can get a pill for it. Doctors will prescribe it to you. But all you have to do is get up and move. And if you can't go outside, stand in front of the TV, watch what's going on, watch April take down people and lift them up. <laughs> lift them up because you do both. You, you, you don't take them down. You call people to account. And move your body. If you're in a wheelchair, move your feet. Flap your wings. Serotonin is the happiness hormone. And we have to keep our heart strong. You know what? If I could be happy not moving a muscle, I wouldn't move. We are made to move. Made to move. So let's get moving. And as we move, we, we grow in happiness and peace. Yeah. Each of us has to find out what we need. What she or he needs in order to know joy. What do you need? That's the question. That's People right. ask you all day long, how are you? And we say, fine. We don't mean it. They don't care. Right? Yeah. The question is, how are you? That's what we have to ask ourselves. You know, I went through a depression when I was at Essence that was something else. Every morning, I was getting up. When I, when I inherited the magazine as editor-in-chief, I had been fashion and beauty editor for 10 years. But when I became editor-in-chief, there was just one magazine, only one property. Within a year and a half, we had a television show. In three years, we had the Essence Awards and then the music festival and an eyewear and hosiery. Well, my eye was jumping. And I was writing an editorial and books. My eyes started jumping. I mean, I was so sad. Married to the best man I know, but I didn't want to be married anymore. And just one morning, I woke up and I said, why? Why are you so sad? Why are you depressed? You know, going to, becoming the editor-in-chief of the magazine without having gone to college was a huge thing. And not everybody agreed that I should have that job. I mean, subsequently I went back to school, but not because anybody agreed that I should. It was like, oh, you don't need to go to school. We went to school and you've got the job and you're making money. Everybody is an expert on you. You have to be the expert. You have to know. And I got up that morning and I just said, what are you not doing for yourself? Oh. I'm not exercising. I'm not doing my meditation. I'm not giving myself to myself. I'm not spending time with me. I'm reading the newspapers and editing manuscripts and trying to show my worthiness. There is nothing you can do. Nothing you can do, no words you can say. There's no love you can give that's going to make everybody love you. So how you feel about me is none of my business. How I feel about me is my only business knowing that you're doing the right thing. That was the day that I decided that I wasn't going to be the editor-in-chief of the magazine anymore. I was going to step up and handed the reins to Monique Greenwood and the others who succeeded her. So, you know, that, that's what I'm saying. We have to be in, tuned with, in tune with what we need. What do you need in order to know your joy? You have to sit still. Yes! Mm. And answer that question. But if we're perpetual motion... We'll always be in some kind of crisis. Mm. The answers lie within, and that's where we have to go. So everyone, we are at the throne. We are at the foot of the throne, getting the wisdom from the queen, oh. Susan Taylor. I'm telling you, she walks in elegance and class, and she speaks it so well. Um, I just, I needed this, because I, 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 it's like it's food for your soul. It's... I'm feeling like church almost, you know, it's, and it doesn't have to be taking a text. It's just remembering who you are, that you have to serve you first. And I love that. And that's why I didn't realize we were going to be going to church like we're going to the <laughs> church of Susan Taylor. But this is what in the spirit was. It was like a drink of water and that dry, hot desert. And we are thirsty and we are yes. hungry. Yes. And uh, we, I mean, there's such hurt out here. We are thirsty and we're hungry. So, guys, again, I want you to run and tell your friends to come on. Um, you don't get a chance to listen and see Susan Taylor all the time. And tonight is a special joy for me and for all of you. And I'm watching everyone, you know, just talking. They miss you. They miss you. 
And, um, and, and for those of you who want to get the writings of Susan Taylor in the spirit, um, it's still on Amazon. You know, there's a big thing now with black books. Everybody's buying black books. Yeah. In the spirit is still here. Um, you can get it at Amazon. You can get it at Target. You can, um, uh, Mahogany Books, it's a black owned bookstore that reports the New York Times bestsellers list, mahoganybooks.com. Um, and Susan, give us some of the names of your other books that you want to that you want to talk about right now so we can get people to, to look you up and just feel the love again. Well, Lessons in Living, All About Love, a book that I did with my husband called Confirmation, The Spiritual Wisdom That Has Shaped Our Lives. But I have to tell you, more than purchasing my books, what I really want people to do is to go to our website. Mm -hmm. caresmentoring.org caresmentoring.org I want to tell you how this nation defines uh, extreme poverty the Let's U.S. Census pardon? Let's talk about that Yes, the U.S. Census Bureau defines poverty as a family income a whole family income of $12,180, they just raised it from 70-something, $12,180-something dollars for a family of four with two related children. Now, you know, it would be difficult for any one person to live anywhere in this nation on $12,000 a year. So to think that we have families who are, and there are families with no income, who are living on food stamps, families living in shelters, and I'm saying, you know, with all of our faith institutions, you can't go into one of our communities, our gentrifying communities, and not see a dozen churches. We, as a people, have a tradition of supporting our faith institutions and our families. But April, not the community organizations that are really doing the work. And we see the money from foundations and philanthropies go to people who use our children as the poster children. But we're not leading those organizations. We're not leading them. So what I'm asking our people to do tonight is to go, find, go to caresmentoring.org, go to the black-led organizations, and invest. I wish people, if you gave us $5 a month, we'd be fine. If, you know, enough people in black America just gave $5 a month to the HBCUs that they graduated from or didn't graduate from or didn't even go to, and to the organizations that are really rebuilding the village, this is what we're doing. Rebuilding the village. We need your help. We need your help. Caresmentoring.org. That's what you could really do for me. My books, they'll be out there. They're out there. But caresmentoring.org. And, and, and that and it's big because I'm going to talk about this in a minute. But I just want to say hello to some people. Uh, Derek Rutledge, the, the famous makeup artist of Oprah, Michelle Obama, says hello to you. And oh. the great Paul Wharton, who is over across the pond, is on here right now tonight. Hello, Paul. Hi there. I miss you. Yes, yes, I miss you, Paul. Um, so and Maxwell. Maxwell just sent a little message. Mm, I love Maxwell. you, Max. Which Maxwell? You know the Maxwell. Maxwell is on my on on here. He sure was. Maxwell. <laughs> really? <laughs> I yes. love Maxwell. Hello, Maxwell. Um, I would love to get you on COVID conversations, Maxwell. Oh, hi, Maxwell. Um, I'm a little verklempt on that one. Um, <laughs> so, but let's get back to this. Um, this caresmentoring.org, guys. Caresmentoring.org. I don't know how to pin anything yet. I'm still learning IG but caresmentoring.org. And it says it's a pioneering community galvanizing movement dedicated to alleviating intergenerational poverty among African-Americans. Let's talk about that. And, and I'm, I'm gonna do it in the context of different communities. If we look at our mainstream counterparts, wealth begets wealth. And if you understand there is a wealth gap in this nation, um, before COVID, they said, before COVID, they said it was 288 years that it would take Black America to catch up with the wealth of White America. That's before COVID. And now, and before COVID, there was poverty. Imagine poverty now. And if there is wealth begetting wealth for mainstream America, poverty begets poverty for us. So there's a downward spiral. It seems more so 
for our community, the black and brown community than other communities in this nation. Is that true? It's true. I mean, it's absolutely true because, you know, the, the playing field has never been level. And while our free labor, it was free labor, uncompensated labor created other people's wealth, but created nothing for us except stress, brutality, and profound loss. Mm. And this is really what we're making up for. This is what we have to do. But we have to link arms and aims. We have to learn how to work together. Enslavement. Some people say, oh, you know, we don't want to talk about slavery. You better. We're the only people who don't want to remember our history. We're the ones who need to be saying every day, let us never forget. Let us never forget what our ancestors withstood for the privileges we have today. And you know what I say to myself sometimes when I'm complaining about, oh, I feel a little sad today. I'm not saying negate your sadness. Don't not acknowledge it. But I'm saying to myself sometimes, shut up. <laughs> you are not on somebody's plantation. It's not 1813 when your body does not belong to you. Are you kidding? When somebody could come along and snatch your baby out of your arms and sell that baby away who you would never see again. So this is as good as it has ever been. And when we start focusing, rather, and Tom Burrell, anybody who knows Tom Burrell, I lift that name up. He created the largest black-owned advertising agency in the world, in Chicago. Mm -hmm. uh, Tom Burrell, who has a site challenge and has been losing his site over the years. Did you know that, April? I didn't know Over that. the years, yes. And I, when I was working on my second or third book, I interviewed him. So I said, how do you deal with that? And you know what he said? And I hold on to this. He said, I don't look at what I've lost. I look at what I have left. Wow. Okay. And where we used to live, my husband and I, it was around the corner from the United House for the Blind. Oh. And I'd be crossing Broadway and 63rd Street and blah, 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 complaining about whatever. And then I'd see a young one, a teenager, learning how to walk with a seeing eye dog, or with a stick, a teenager. And I'm saying, what in the world do you have to complain about? Mm. Anything that, is, that needs fixing in our lives is fixable. It's fixable. What is it you need? You need to earn more money? Can you bake? Can you write? Can you fix somebody's computer? Mm. Can you help somebody? Can you write something for somebody? Whatever skills you have, what? Refine them and turn it into a business. We've got to become entrepreneurs. And you know when you work outside of your community, those people get on your nerves. Those people don't treat us well. And let me tell you, I worked in a black, I grew up in a black-owned institution. And black people, we have our drama too. It's a different kind of drama, but the drama exists. Oh, trust, we know. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we go to work to earn money for the things we need. You have two children to send to college. Oh, yes. We want to buy homes. We want to secure our elder years so that we don't have to be taken care of, as most of us took care of our, of our parents. We don't want that to be our story. So when you show up, this is, this is the, the, the work of the National Cares Mentoring Movement. What we do with parents and children and with ourselves as mentors and leaders, we provide a prophylactic, a, a, a security, a scaffolding, so we don't point the finger at other people. We cannot take responsibility for other people's craziness. We have to look in the mirror. We have to look in the mirror and say, who am I and where am I going? And what is it that I want out of life? And how do I get there? So what is the definition of poverty? And what do we do to stave it off? And what can we do to help prevent it? Once again, and, and supporting your organization, but the definition what do we do to stave it off and what is it? You know, how do we prevent it? Well, you know what, the, the way that poverty is, is defined in this nation is not the way that I'm going to define it. It's okay. defined as described with this meager income, family income for four children, mm -hmm. which throws you into crime. You've got to do something on the side in order to take care of yourself and to feed yourself. Mm -hmm. You're living in poverty when you can't afford safe housing, safe, affordable housing. You're living in poverty when there's food scarcity, when your children or you are going to sleep hungry every night. I thought I knew. 
until I stepped into these schools, poverty schools, second, third, fourth generations in cities all over the country. We're in 58 cities across the nation. You step into these schools and you're, I'm looking in the face for the first time of hungry children in the United States, hungry children, mm -hmm. who come to school having been abused in the night, having slept in shelters, hearing gunshots all night long, surrounded by unrelenting violence. That's living in poverty. And it's probably not anyone who's on this, on this, this call, and on this know, IG and, gathering. And, you know, and the sad piece about it is we want to help many of us, like you say, I have never seen that. But there are right. so many people who deal with that. <clears throat> it pains me. And to know that there are children, because of COVID, who weren't getting nutritious meals because they would only get their, their main meal, the only meal of the day from school. It hurts my heart to hear that. It hurts my heart to see that. And I'm from Baltimore, and there is blight and poverty here in this city. That's right. Terrible That's right. poverty in this city. I mean, and it was spotlighted after Freddie Gray. So again... What do we do? Right. We, don't, we have to push from the pews to the pulpit. The ministers are overwhelmed. You know, leading a church is no easy thing. When you've got everybody in your ear and you've got to shepherd so many people and people who are shut in and hospitalized and when you could visit, you did visit and now you're going to be doing that again. Zoom calls every moment. That's stress, you know? Mm -hmm. We need... If, if We have to look at what we do with the money that we invest in our faith institutions. Sometimes we're raising, what, $25,000, $35,000 for pastors, 25th, 35th anniversary. But the children around the corner in the schools don't have books. They don't have computers. So Preach. what I'm saying is, what do we value? If, if, if our sanctuaries were doing the larger critical work of restoring communities and restoring lives, mm -hmm. I wouldn't be doing this. 37 years at Essence was a long time. It is a long time. A long time. I thought I'd be living in Florida, going, they have more HBCUs than any other state, that I would teach writing, that I would teach magazine making and newspaper making. That's what I thought I would do, have a little something where my people come from in the Caribbean. That is so far removed from what my everyday is like. Yeah. But it's never too late, and this is what we have to realize. We are remaking ourselves, and that work, we're remaking our communities. It begins with us. What do we spend our time doing? Every conversation we have is not an important one. Yeah. You know, I mean, everybody likes a little piece of juicy gossip, but, you know, I don't need to be passing it on. And I don't need to hear, like, a recounting of it every day. These are, these are moments that we should be using to think about entrepreneurship. We're starting something. We have it in a few cities, mm -hmm. and they're called Community Wellness and wealth building circles, uh -huh. community wellness and wealth building circles. So it's people like us who look like we're able and stable most days, and most days we are, not every day. What we do is we come together and with a curriculum and provide that prophylactic so that when we step out into that other world and people are targeting us and following us and disrespecting us at the boardroom table, we don't take it personally. That's their problem. It's not mine, right? Uh -huh. That's the prophylactic. And then what we do is we're putting our money together. Uh -huh. We have to learn how to trust one another again Ooh. so that we can buy the buildings in our community and not have them gentrified. Not have them gentrified. We cannot do that unless we are going to what? Aggregate, put together, pool our resources. This is what the ancestors did. In the yeah, Caribbean, they, they call it susu. You know, everybody... Southern people, every week, somebody put in whether you had five cents or five dollars or fifty dollars, and that money circulated. And that's how we bought property and did a whole host of things. That's how we built our churches and our schools. So we have all the wisdom, and we have the history. We have the know-how. We, we just, just have to really have a plan and implement it. And put it into practice. My mother used to that's say, right. my mother used to say, my late mother used to say, she said, April, you know, the reason why we have baby showers and things like that is because we all come together as a community to help one another. And I said, I didn't look at it that way. And she was right, you know, because a lot of times you don't always have it. 
um, and you want to help one another, if you pull it together, it becomes your cup overflows. You know. April, do you remember Father George Clemens? He came out of Chicago. The names are very familiar. Yes. He started something called One Church, One Child. Mm -hmm. One Church, One Returning Citizen. Mm -hmm. So that folks coming out of incarceration would be adopted mm. by the sanctuary, by the church, and stabilized. One church, one family. Mm. It didn't succeed. We have to push for that again from the pews toward the pulpit. Not overwhelming the pastors. They have enough. First ladies have enough. This is what we can do. We can't do this alone. The National Cares Mentoring Movement can't do this alone. We have MOUs with the links, mm -hmm. you know, with our sororal and fraternal organizations, and with the National um, uh, Institute for Black Child Development. All of us in this together, pulling in the same direction, rowing smartly in the same direction with all of our oars in the water. That is the essential lesson for us as a people to learn and to practice. Amen. I want to go to something someone said. It's, it's, so it sparked my um, attention and curiosity because I want to hear what you have to say about this. I understand where they're coming from, but in this moment, I think we have to change our mindset. It says, my mother told me just because we are poor doesn't mean people need to know. She said, hold your head high. I'm in agreement, but right now, we got to tell each other. We got to let people know when we're hurting. Because if you don't tell someone, it could be detrimental to your health and to your life. Don't you agree with that? You are so right. You know, let me tell you a quick story. This happened on the south side of Chicago, one of the schools that we're working in, in the nation. And a young man would come to school, and he was very smelly. And you know how children, <laughs> children can be so unkind and insensitive. And they just teased this boy into shame. And one teacher was wise enough to say, let me... Let me sit with you and find out what's going on in your home. You know what she learned? His grandmother was raising him, April. There was no electricity in the home, no gas in the home, no place for him to wash his clothing. With his permission, she came back to the school and she told his classmates. The classmates surrounded him, brought clothing. I mean, took his clothes home to wash them. There are people who will be unkind, but those aren't the people we're talking about. We can't hide when there's a need. If you're hungry, you need to say so. And I think that if you're a good friend to somebody, a friend wouldn't have to tell me that she didn't have any money. Just talking to her, I know she's struggling. Put a little something in an envelope and send it her way. Mm. If you have a good friend and that friend is really a good friend, and we can't have 10 best friends, you know, oh, she, these are my, my 10 best friends. You don't have, none of us have what it takes to serve 10 best friends and ourselves and all the other places where we give. So I think that there are places, there are places now where people can go and get food, mostly. What about the children who don't have computers? And who are living where there's no broadband. They are falling and, through the cracks. They are falling uh, through the cracks right now. And there's poor black children. There's going to be a lost generation. There's going to be a lost generation. Education. Better not be. Better not be. It, it, you Better don't want it to be. be. But the reality in 2020, there are kids who don't have wife. I saw an amazing picture, Susan. Queen Susan. Two children were sitting outside of Taco Bell or Burger King or wherever just to get Wi-Fi during their homework on the street. What happens when the snow comes? My heart is aching for us, for society right now. Here's what we do. What do we do? We have to become conscious consumers. Mm -hmm. We just spend our money any old place. We don't even, we buy the car without seeing if that car manufactures advertising on urn. A-U-R-N, in essence, Ebony, when it was alive, on the few, can you imagine the few little radio stations we still own? We don't, we don't take into account the importance of, 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 of supporting those who support us and withdrawing our resources from those who don't support us and our children. We need to have a, and this, this is what we should be doing in our sanctuaries. Yeah. Every sanctuary should say, okay, we're keeping a report card. 
this is what we're asking politicians to push forward for our community. This is what we need. We need mental health support in our communities. Are you for that? I'm going to vote for you if you are. And if you don't deliver it, I'm not voting for you again. We have to hold people accountable. We should have a list of corporations that are investing in HBCUs and that are investing in the shelters and the places where poor people in our community must turn for resources. What about the computers for our children and Wi-Fi service? Uh -huh. We need computers. Our children must have them in order to catch up and to stay ahead. You know, to not catch phones, up. Let me just say, say not that. phones, not tablets, not computers, laptops. Computers, computers, not phones, computers, not tablets, computers, computers or laptops. And you think about the money that we spend on technology. So these need to be, and I don't think that they need to be mean, you know, demands. They don't need to be angry demands. They need to be serious demands. We're not going to spend money with X company unless these things are delivered to these five schools. This is what we're asking of you. And this is the amount of money. What, what, I wish Julianne Malveau would text and tell us what we're spending right now. You know, oh that, my that, gosh, her mind, she's a brilliant mind. She's, she's brilliant. brilliant. She can lay it out. Oh you know, God. the black GPD. What we spend is beyond. It's beyond. But we spend it recklessly. And now we have to spend strategically. Because the only thing that is really understood in corporate America is what? It's money. This it's is, the, so green. This is not, the society it's not we live color, in. It's not black, it's white. Or white, it's green. It's it green. green. It's and, green. And, we, and, and, this, and this is the thing. You hit the nail squarely again. We don't realize who we are and what we bring to the table. And once we That's do... Right. A lot of this stuff wouldn't be happening if we stand up and realize we are kings and queens who spend at higher rates than other groups. And we can demand more than what we get right now. So that's, it goes right back to the original. Know who you are. Self-love. And a plan. And a and plan. plan. And, and a plan. plan. We have to push. Because, you know, in many ways, our sororities, fraternities, our faith institutions, they're the independent entities we have. The media organizations are not so independent. They're depending on white dollars yeah. to move them forward. We have to become a self-supporting community, and we can do that. We really can. So the plan is to hold those people where we spend our money, those entities where we spend our money, where we invest to hold them accountable, and to do it without threat, but to do it seriously. We are going to post we're going to tweet, we're going to Instagram, we're going to let people know about those who are supporting our communities and those who are not. And we're not going to spend our money there. That's what we have to do. And until we do that, things will not change. They'll not change. So once again, caresmentoring.org, cares, C-A-R-E-S, mentoring, M-E-N-T-O-R-I-N-G.org um, is the site and is the the organization that Susan is talking about donating and is talking about poverty, trying to eliminate, alleviate the intergenerational poverty among African Americans. Us, us, us. Now, I'm gonna uh, before we uh, lose time, and and I so appreciate you greatly for coming on tonight. Oh, I've enjoyed this. I reached out to Queen Susan, and she said yes, no question. I said yes, Susan Taylor, in the spirit. And it's people, guys, I bring people on that I admire, that I like, and I love. And I hope you're enjoying these conversations because they're cathartic to me. And I know if I'm going through it, you're going through it too. I think we're all in this together. And we just need to say, I'm hurting. Just acknowledge I'm hurting. Go get your sister so you can say hi to, to Miss Taylor. Okay. So you're gonna see, you're gonna see my babies. I pray the dog doesn't come either, but, but <laughs> That dog is getting on my nerves. Come on, they can all come. They can oh, all come. Anyway, but but there, someone mentioned it, and it really, really um, hit home just now. Someone mentioned it on here um, that my aunt's on here. Hi, Lee. How you doing? Um, someone mentioned it about these stories that we saw last week. I saw it on CNN. They were um, displacing, evicting people. Last week, and it was an elderly woman, and I, my heart broke. We're already hurting. What are your thoughts about these evictions that are happening? They're trying to stave off these evictions now, but there are going to be evictions even in the midst of all of this. 
I think there's an imbalance. I think that, you know, for the government to say that there will, no one will be evicted from his or her apartment is the right thing from their living space. It's the right thing. But also landlords have to be considered too. So let's say banks, banks have money. Let's just put a stop right now to mortgage payments so that landlords don't have to make those payments and people who are vulnerable don't have to pay that rent. And let's figure this out. You know, John Hope Bryant is a good friend and a brilliant. Oh, have you had yeah. John on? I, oh, I, I have had John on something else, but I'm going to bring him on again. He's oh, amazing. absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. He helped to write the CARES Act. And, you know, my mother would say it all the time. Where there's a will, there's a way. We can figure this out. This is not like we were saying earlier. It's not like the 1800s when we were seriously under heel. What we have to do now is link arms and aims, love one another, be as the great poet laureate Gwendolyn Brooks, the first black woman to earn a Pulitzer Prize. She just said, we are each other's keeper. We are each other's harvest. We are each other's magnitude and bond. Let's live that. Yeah. Yeah. We have to live that. We have to live that. Exactly. Susan Taylor, in the spirit, former editor in chief of Essence Magazine, the author of In the Spirit and other books, go on Amazon, go on um, mahoganybooks.com, look for her books, support uh, the caresmentoring.org to prevent poverty. We just support you. We thank you for pouring into us tonight. And I want to show you, come here, Ryan. I want to show you the two that I have to pour into. Come here, little one. This is the 12 year old. She turns 13 on November 3rd. And wow. Look, okay. Where are you? There she is. Say hi. Oh, hi, That's beauty. Grace. That's Grace. I named her Grace because God's grace is sufficient. I was pregnant with her when my mother transitioned this earth. Oh. And come here. And, and come here. Come, come here, Ryan. And this is, <laughs> I'm telling you, this is my 18 year old. Hi. This is my eighteen-year-old. What beautiful children you have! And the dog is in here too, and I, I want know. the dog to leave. Oh, I, they're I don't gorgeous! Like the dog right now. No, Just no, no! Put gorgeous. it down! Put it down! Put it down! Put it down. <laughs> <laughs> April, can we just say that we love you for who you are? Oh, thank just you. so authentic. And when we see you sitting in there, you know, holding our friend accountable, and among the only face that is ours. We are so proud of you. So very proud of you. Well, I thank you. And Keep I, doing the good work. Keep just being who you are. Authentic, you. real, focused on our people, speaking boldly and brilliantly for us. That's oh you. Gosh, thank and we you. love you for it. But you know what? I love you for who you are. And I'm just, something came to my spirit. There's a song by Brian Courtney Wilson. Great work. God is doing a great work. Mm. He's doing a great work in you. Through us. Through us. Through <laughs> us. Through us all. Well, God bless I bless you and thank you. You too. And I will reach out to you very soon. Guys, thank you for joining in and listening to Susan Taylor and her heart, her mind, her movement to help people. Well, um, this is May I say one more thing? We're gonna have a gala, you know. I'm turning 75. I can't believe No, it. no, 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 no. That's no, not no, 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 no. How can it be? 75, January 23rd, yes. Wait a minute, and wait a minute. Our, you are turning 75. I am. Well, if you all do the math, I came to Essence when I was, what, 24 years old? I stayed there 37 years. I've been out of there about 10. So that's it, 10, 12. You know yes. I'm going to say, but I'm not going to say it because we're a mixed company. That's a family conversation. Oh, my gosh, you are. Woo. So what I'm asking, though, is that we, we're going to have a gal. It's going to be virtual. It's going to be fabulous. I just need, you don't have to pay. Now, if, if it was an in-person one, people would have to pay $1,000 a ticket. We need the gala in order to keep our programs going. 58 cities serving thousands of young people in group mentoring classrooms. That's what we do. Helping them to heal the trauma of growing up in poverty and the university for parents. Helping parents in poverty to recover their lives. So I'm just asking you all to be with us when we announce the gala, and I hope that you, I know you'll promote it for us. I will. Uh, April, and we just want as many people there as possible. You don't have to pay, just come. And go to caresmentoring.org, stay in touch with us, you'll see when the gala's coming, and make a donation. No amount is too small. 
God bless you. We will definitely Thank support you. the gala. And I'm going to tell you, people cannot believe that you are 74. I can't believe you, it. It's something, <laughs> it's, it's something with that melanin. I can't believe Cicely Tyson is the age she is. Oh my I gosh. cannot believe. I'm like, what? Well, I just turned 53. So I'm praying that I can, I can look as good as both of you at, at each level I go. That's all I'm going to say. 